Uh, his talk today, uh, software-defined radio, single processing, or, uh, single processing with a $5 microcontroller. So Indeed. Give it up. Woo! Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm going to speak about my experiences developing a sort of standalone SDR, software-defined radio platform um, that isn't dependent upon a computer to do, to do its magic. Um, but first, let me review what a radio is in general. Um, you know, a radio receiver typically amplifies a chunk of spectrum, filters it, uses a frequency translation technique called mixing, to convert it to some other frequency and then performs a demodulation operation on it in order to recover the information, whether it be audio or television or, or Bluetooth or, or whatever. Uh, Software-defined radio simply changes the last box into uh, an A to D converter, digitizes a signal, and then does all of the demodulation and decoding using general purpose computing hardware and software. Uh, and typically that winds up looking something like this, you know, additional filtering, uh, decimating of the signal bandwidth in order to make processing easier, uh, demodulation algorithms, and decoding if it's digital data into packets or whatever, whatever the data scheme happens to be. So this is my chosen platform. This is the HackRF1 from Great Scott Gadgets. This, wait, where'd you go? There he is right there. <laughs> Michael Osman's radio. Applause line. I didn't. I didn't expect that. <laughs> so, uh, what this device boils down to is, um, you've got a radio inside the little sort of golden dotted line area there. Um, it's got a bunch of amplification, a couple of intermediate frequency mixers, um, and then there's a, a chip up at the top nearest to the HackRF logo that is the actual A to D and D to A converter, and then there's a little bit of glue logic in a large chip, and then the largest chip is a dual-core ARM microcontroller. And that normally, in, in, in common use case, the original use case of the HackRF, is designed to just shoot all the baseband data that was digitized out to a PC for processing. I got the bright idea of sticking uh, an LCD panel, navigation controls, uh, audio interface, and an SD card slot onto that board, because it comes with headers built in, so you can have demodulating analog signals, you know, like uh, narrowband FM, like walkie-talkies, um, ham, uh, yeah, pretty much any kind of narrowband audio signal, and um, also doing a few digital modes, including boats, aircraft, and tire pressure monitors on cars, which I'm somewhat notorious for. Um, and I'm also, I'll also speak about my intent for the future for this device, which is to be able to do more digital modes, uh, including maybe APRS and Bluetooth LE beacons and a bunch of other interesting things that are simple enough to be able to be accomplished on a device like this. Uh, I would also like to be able to do capture and replay and, and signal generation and transmitting. Um, so let's get into more detail about what we have to play with on the HackRF. Uh, the LPC4300 series consists of two ARM microcontrollers. Uh, they're Cortex-M controllers. One core is the M4F, which has hardware DSP instructions and hardware floating point, and then there's an M0, which really isn't very good at math at all. Uh, but it runs at 200 megahertz, um, which, you know, is, is really nothing to sneeze at. Um, I grew up in, or had computers in the 80s and learned how to program in the 80s, and people were doing amazing stuff in the demo scene and writing video games on 7.16 megahertz 68,000s in Amigas and stuff. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't find the greatest demo picture. <laughs> so this is how I wound up breaking down the architecture of the device. Um, since we've got two processors, and one's really good at math and one really isn't, it seemed fitting to do all of the signal processing on the M4F on the left side here, and to do all the user interface stuff side. So the M0 sets up all the hardware, uh, reads and writes to the LCD panel, renders the user interface, um, and then performs miscellaneous I.O. to control the radios, um, set up the real-time clock, all that stuff. And then the M4F does the heavy lifting of receiving or sending samples to the radio portion of the, device, of the hardware and all the signal processing involved in that. So 
it would be nice to have some form of an operating system, especially because we've got two processors we've got to work with. And I need to communicate data back and forth. Uh, I need to be able to receive interrupts, handle them, defer them to the extent necessary for processing later on without choking um, response time for new interrupts coming in. So I poked around a bunch and found an operating system that it turns out is, I really like it. It's called Chibios, C-H-I-B-I-O-S. And it's got a ton of operating system features. Um, you might ask, well, why didn't you use Linux? Um, well, that's because this Cortex M series part has got only 200K worth of RAM, uh, which is not even, I, I don't even know what the Linux kernel takes in its minimum configuration these days, but I imagine it's well above 200K. Um, however, there is a little bit of Linux in the design. Uh, in order to communicate between the two processors, I implemented a FIFO scheme, and I, I basically ripped off the KFIFO implementation in the kernel because it's brilliant, and I talk about it every opportunity I can. So um, we don't have a whole lot of RAM, and if you're writing a user interface, that tends to eat a lot of program space. Fortunately, the HackRF has got a one megabyte SPI flash on it, and it has a quad mode that allows you to pull four bits out of the out of this little serial flash part at one time, and you can operate it at 100 megahertz. So if you do the math, you've got roughly a 400 megabit interface. Still not super fast. That means, I, th I think, what's the math? 400, 10 to 20, 32 bit instructions per second. So, or sorry, 10 to 20 million instructions per second. But if you're writing a user interface and you're modest about what you ask it to do, it turns out to be plenty fast. Um, oh, and this was the slide I meant to show when I was explaining that. This is basically the, the wire protocol for an SPI flash device. Uh, so, as I said, uh, RAM is very limited. It's broken into four different chunks, and there's two regions that are considered local. They're, re they're tied in really closely to the microcontroller core that's executing the code. And so I opted to use those, of course, to run the code for the baseband, since that's where I really need the performance. Uh, there are other blocks that I've dedicated to holding the stack for the M0 processor, the, the user interface processor. It's running code out of flash, and it's using the slower chunk of RAM to, to, as its stack. Now, a nice design about this ARM processor is it's got this matrix configuration where any bus master can connect to any slave device independent of any other connection, as long as you don't have two masters trying to reach the same slave at the same time, at which point there's you know a contention arbitration scheme that takes place and you wind up losing a lot of performance. So by cordoning off certain chunks of RAM to, to certain tasks and to specific processors, I was able to get pretty much as much throughput as is possible theoretically. Uh, and by the way, if I'm losing anyone, uh, you just Raise your hand. <laughs> I, I, I'm happy to answer questions as we go along. Uh, so we've got two cores. It's kind of a challenging situation to debug in, especially when we're talking about a computing device that does not have a screen, can't, doesn't have enough memory to implement SSH, or frankly, even something like Telnet or a TCP IP stack. There's really none of that. So best option is to go with JTAG or serial wire debugging. Serial wire debugging is a little bit easier because you only need two wires plus ground to make that happen. But it turns out the way the chip is implemented, you can only access the M4 core from ser the serial wire debug interface. So I went with a JTAG interface. I can reach both cores and debug them both simultaneously. And I use this device, which is called a Blackmagic probe, which I highly recommend. Uh, what it does is it, it provides an interface directly to GDB. So you start up your ARM GDB and you just point it at the serial port that the Blackmagic probe exposes, and you're debugging. And that's all there is to it. No open OCD configuration or other hinky software that... Blackmagic probe? I don't know. Gareth McMullen, I, I think he's busy with a whole lot of other stuff. <laughs> so the Blackmagic probe is a little hard to acquire, although um, One Bit Squared carries it, and, and so Peter's happy to sell Blackmagic probes to the hill. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think Gareth is really supporting it as well as he could. <laughs> um, 
now let's get into signal processing more. So in software-defined radio, um, you're dealing with much smaller bit depths or sample sizes than you would in, say, audio. Uh, in audio, you're doing 16 or 24 bits at a time. With the HackRF, it produces 8-bit samples. And it turns out the Cortex-M4 has got uh, a lot of these vector instructions that are finely tuned to doing exactly this type of signal processing. Here's an example where you've got uh, two 16-bit values packed into a 2-bit word and another, and then you can multiply either 16-bit chunk accumulated into another register and then write it to a, a, a fourth register, I guess it is, yeah. Fifth register, fourth, I can't count. Um, and all that happens in one instruction cycle, which for a $5 microcontroller is pretty amazing, if you ask me. Um, doing doing uh, software-defined radio also requires doing a lot of complex math. Uh, complex is in complex numbers uh, and imaginary numbers and all that. This is typically how you multiply two complex numbers together. Uh, you can see there's four multiplications and two additions. Uh, one is actually a subtraction, but same difference. And there are instructions f perfectly optimized for that, too, that also execute in a single instruction cycle. You take 16-bit integers packed into 32-bit integers. You can multiply them in different combinations. Oops, sorry. Ah, wrong way. So you've got a whole smattering of instructions that combine your, your operands in different ways in order to implement things like complex multiplication, FFT butterflies, it's, it's, it's ideal. So I, I, it turns out on a Mac you can't actually see your notes at the same time that you're showing your slides. So I emailed my notes to, me, to myself and I'm reading them on my phone. <laughs> so um, next thing I want to talk about is uh, what Osman refers to as the HackRF middle finger. <laughs> this is the DC offset spike, which is uh, an artifact of the way the radio is designed. And it's, it's very commonplace in, in radios with the same architecture. Uh, the trouble is, is that it tends to sit right on the top of the signal you're tuned to. So uh, a common technique to deal with that is to tune a little bit off to the side. Um, so maybe instead of tuning right to 852 megahertz, which is where this is set up right now, you tune to 851, and your, your signal shows up not in the middle, but offset a little bit. And that has, you know, obvious benefits. You don't have the spike sort of sitting, sitting there cluttering up your, your, your data as you're collecting it. But it also turns out if, if you shift exactly one quarter of your sh sample rate up or down, the math to do that gets really easy. Instead of using the, the common technique of multiplying the spectrum that you've captured by um, a complex sinusoid of the frequency that you want to shift, all you have to do is do a bunch of simple arithmetic and, and uh, sorry, addition and subtraction. So something that would have taken a bunch of sines and cosines and a bunch of uh, four multiplies and two adds per sample turns into basically a single addition per, per sample saves a lot of time if if you plan things out so that you're shifting exactly one quarter of your sampling rate. Uh, another common technique that's used is what's called a CIC filter, which is like a comb integrator. I should have actually looked up. What's that? Yes, cascade integrator comb, um, which it turns out is nothing but an adder and an accumulator. Uh, instead of the common way of implementing filters by doing a lot of multiplications and additions per sample, you do is you just set up an accumulate or a series of accumulators that sit there and just accumulate the value coming in. And it turns out they'll even they'll even overflow. But it turns out the overflow is part of the magic, and it's way too deep of a subject to go into now. But the net effect is you get this kind of interesting comb filter effect. And if you're trying to pick out a very narrow band signal, like the region shown in yellow there out of a very wide band uh, capture, or, or wide capture bandwidth. Um, CIC filters turn out to be pretty much ideal, uh, require almost no hardware to, to accomplish. And they just require a little bit of planning to make sure that 
when you when you downsample your data, you don't wind up with the folding effect, which is represented in the graph on the bottom, folding into a region where you're getting significant signals into the radio. Uh, now, there's another trick that you can play with CIC filters, which is basically to flatten them out into FIR filters, which looks a bit like this. Um, and instead of having this integrator, if you already have code to do a, a finite impulse response filter, you can just do it this way. And that's neither here nor there, except that by combining this, this translation trick that I talked about earlier, shifting the frequencies just using adds and, and subtracts, you can combine them with filters like these to do both of the processes in a single step. And so I, I use that in the port pack code to take the signal coming in from the radio, decimate it by two from typically three megahertz sampling rate down to 1.5, and at the same time shift that DC offset, that middle finger, out of the way so that I could just pick up the signal I, I wanted right out of the middle of the, the spectrum. Oh, wow, I'm blowing through this. <laughs> Okay, so this is uh, my really, 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 really weak slide. I, I just ran out of time to draw a good, pretty picture of uh, clock recovery. So when you're doing, when you're working with digital data, you need to recover the clock that the data was was output with. Uh, and the trouble is, you know, in, in a in a purely digital environment, there really is no clock. In an analog environment, you've got these gently curving waveforms. And you have to somehow divine where is the beginning of each bit. And there's a technique that I'm fond of called early late gate, which basically sums up the, the waveform in two regions slightly offset within a single bit time and then compares them. And if it's too high or too low, it, what it does is it basically shifts the window. So it's kind of a form of a phase lock loop, um, but it, it works really well and it turns out it's very easy to implement. Um, also, because of the way I've implemented the code, I can do it in floating point because I've, I've whittled down the, the data rate, the sample rate, with a whole bunch of filtering and decimation, the stuff I described earlier, before I have to do this. And then I can drop over to using the hardware floating point, which is a little bit slower, but really deals with this very simply and elegantly. Um, here is a bit of an eye chart. This is where I, I actually learned a lot of these techniques. Uh, there was a company called Harris, which I don't think is the Stingray Harris that was purchased by, or at least if it is, apparently they sold off their chip making portion of their company to a company called Intersil, which is making these chips from the 90s, which were basically software defined radio chips. And if you spend a lot of time studying this, most of the techniques I've just spoken about are all represented in this diagram and in the roughly 80 page uh, data sheet that goes with the chip. It's called the HSP50210. Uh, wow. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of time for questions and answers. So, uh, a lot of the, a lot of where I learned about the DSP instructions available on the ARM Cortex M4 is from this book. Uh, it's now when it's, I, th I think they may have, may have come out with a fourth edition. I've got the third edition. And the, the best part about this book is in the very back, they've got diagrams that show you all of the different DSP instructions and an entire data flow. Uh, in fact, I, I lifted about three of my diagrams from this book. Then, of course, the book I always like talking about. This is uh, Understanding Digital Signal Processing by Richard Lyons. And it's a pretty good signal processing book in general, but really I would just buy it for Chapter 13, which is great once you've kind of mastered signal processing in general and you want to start optimizing like crazy and, and trying to get something to work in a very resource-limited environment. Chapter 13 is packed with, I think, 60 or 70, 50 or 60 different tips on how to do things more simply uh, in just about every form of, of digital signal processing. So it's, it's great. And I'm out of slides. <laughs> so um, can I answer any questions about, in general, what it is I just said or what I'm trying to accomplish or, yes? As a, as an add -on, as okay. Yeah. So, so this is is designed to plug into the HackRF. It it takes advantage of a bunch of bunch of GPIO ports or pins, uh, a couple serial ports, 
and drives uh, a bunch of hardware. I've got a, um, a four-way navigation control, uh, a jog wheel that rotates clockwise and counterclockwise, a select button in the middle. This LCD panel has a parallel interface, which is a little bit different than most LCDs this size. Um, I can actually send 16 bits worth of pixels at, to it at the same time and at a rate of about 5 or 6 megahertz. So the refresh rate on the display is really good compared to most of the displays I've seen, which are all SPI based. It's got a resistive touch screen. I don't, I'm not really fond of resistive touch screens, so I've been trying not to design the user interface around it. Uh, but there are places where, say, you want to type in a frequency to tune to, and instead of having to run this jog wheel around for two minutes trying to get up to five gigahertz, you can just type it right in. Uh, so that's, that's a, a positive feature. Um, the micro SD card, I've tested to write speeds of about two, two mega, two megabytes a second, which should be good for doing a lot of lower bandwidth SDR logging. Um, if, if you're demodulating a signal and you want to go and log packets that you've received based on timestamp, there's a real time clock in here that you can use to get the timestamp. And then there's certainly enough IO to go and log all those packets to the SD card. And in an earlier version of the firmware, I actually had all that stuff working and was logging tire pressure monitors and boats and stuff. Um, because I've rebaked all of the firmware on top of Chibios, I've ditched a few of the features and I'm trying to get back up to par parity with the firmware I had before. Um, yes? Well, uh, you know, first of all, just not having to juggle with the laptop in general. Um, I, I go to a coffee shop near my house where there's one of these four-way crossing signals but they're linked wirelessly. And if I were to stand out there on a busy intersection with my laptop, then I would probably attract attention fairly quickly. So the ability to both do a spectrum analysis and do a capture of signals that were present in the range of spectrum I thought they were transmitting in would be a way for me to rather innocuously do a little bit of hacking on, on that setup without having to cart my laptop there. So that's that's one example that, that I trot out. Um, I, I also, and, and this is firmware that still has to come about. I'm, I'm probably about a, three or four weeks from implementing this. I'm eager to do a wideband spectrum analysis where instead of just sitting on a particular frequency and capturing the spectrum around that frequency, I want to go and tune across the entire band, capturing both the received signal strength that comes out of the second intermediate frequency chip and also digitize the spectrum itself and do an FFT on it, and then accumulate all of that stuff and do wideband surveys, kind of like what Mike was talking about today in his talk. Um, and in that case, I could imagine hooking the thing up to a big battery and just leaving it somewhere, you know, at a site where you want to figure out if there are interesting and perhaps not permitted signals that you want to you want to tackle. So that, that's another example. Um, I'm also, I, I just got my ham radio license, and I would really like to, thank you. Another applause line I didn't expect, but thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I really, I'm a space nerd, and I bought a Yagi, and I'm like, find me some satellites. Uh, I, something that's a, a longer term goal would be to decode things like APT transmissions from the weather service satellites. So instead of getting your weather satellites off of banal internet websites, how, how very crude. I would like to just pick it up right and have it display on the screen. And that would be totally feasible. Um, I would love to use this thing camping, go out and, and make contacts. I mean, the, the power output on the HackRF is very low. So if you were to do that, you would have to use something like PSK31 or Whisper or something like that in order to really get some, some serious range, and, and of course a good, a good antenna. Um, so I, I envision that being another use case. Um, not quite so security privacy focused, but still fun. Yes? Are the plans available for confinement? Yeah, I completely glossed over that, didn't I? Uh, so this is an open source design like the HackRF. The hardware was designed in KiCad, and the KiCad files are in a GitHub repo. So if you just go to GitHub and you look for Portapack, you should find it. In fact, I think the actual repo, repo name is Portapack hyphen HackRF. Uh, any possibility of extensibility without having to go in and you know, plug in architecture anything 
Uh, extensibility in the in the firmware or yeah. oh, I, so I I tried really hard, and that's that's part of the reason I introduced the operating system was to have a certain amount of common API underneath that you could take advantage of, and I've been trying hard to kind of smush things into sort of an application paradigm where you could build something on top of this application class and it would have the services necessary to act and and work with the radio and, and the display and all that and then show up in the menu so you could pick it and and have full access to the widget set all that stuff so the intent is for people to write additional apps um, I would like to see people who are in a different legal environment than the US do things like implement um, AppCo P25 um, with the appropriate Codex and and um, what's is there a DSD? I think that's the name of a library that um, is that the name of the library that does P25 digital codec stuff. Yeah, it's digital okay, cool. Uh, and on that note, I also I'm reminded that I would love to at some point port the Codec 2 library over so that um, ham radio people can use Codec 2 to transmit very narrow band audio. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, my intuition, and it's only intuition at this point, is that I might be able to deal with some forms of modulation like Bluetooth low energy that have a pretty high bit rate, but ultimately are band limited to maybe about a megahertz. Um, and have a simple modulation like, you know, 2 FSK. Uh, I have thoughts on how to accomplish it at that rate, but I think above that it's just not going to happen. So I think if, you, if you're talking about signals that have more than about a megahertz worth of bandwidth or, or symbol rate, I don't think it's likely you're going to be able to do that under any circumstances. But it's still, it's, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, I hear my name. Oh, yes. Uh, it was never enabled because it was never implemented. <laughs> um, so that is something that I would like to do in the medium ter or short term um, in the next four weeks, I would say. Um, in fact, I might try, if there aren't too many other outstanding bugs that are freaking people out, would like to try and do something like that for the CTF at DEF CON. Because I think there might be a little bit of replay attack fun that could be had. And so I'll, I'm going to give it a shot. The, the, the SD card library or the, the SD card code is there. So I, I can read and write the SD card. And, and in fact, the test jig that I used to test all the porta packs to date uses the SD card interface and the FATFS library from Elm Chan to write at speeds of up to two megabytes a second. So I figure doing significant, you know, pretty wideband capture should be feasible. Yes? So typing with a scroll wheel would be damn near impossible and do it quickly because Have you ever played a video game from the 80s? <laughs> that's, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, it's not, it's not great, but I think it'd be better than like, you know, the, the, um, Apple TV and stuff where you have to move left and right and pick out the letter. And then there is the touch screen, and there may be a way to do some sort of T9 input. Yeah. Uh, uh, other than the touch screen, could you use the, uh, like, a Y cable plug in, like, a keyboard or a paper? That is a difficult subject because the, the hardware on the LPC4320, I believe, supports OTG functionality and can act as a host, but there isn't any hardware on the HackRF to power a device. So you'd have to supply power, and you'd also need to get a full USB host stack operating on, on the, in the firmware. Which, you know, it's not impossible, but it is definitely a, an undertaking. So there might be a way, if you have some way to inject power, to pull something like that off, but I haven't given it a whole lot of thought. Yes? Yeah, um, maybe using all the serial ports. <laughs> uh, so I wound up having to repurpose pretty much every available pin on the HackRF interface to get all of the functionality that I've got in there now. Uh, I probably could have 
it, it was pretty rough. I wound up I wound up wound up reusing one of the audio codec interfaces interface pins to also go to the CPLD for programming. There's a little glue logic CPLD on the Porta Pack that I, I want to be able to program, but it comes at the it excludes operation of the audio codec at the same time, which I didn't think was going to be a big deal. But I was that pinched for for extra pins. Dominic. I was going to say, Mike and I had a project which we had on the back burner for about six years, which is to do keyboard stuff over audio. So you could probably take PS2 keyboard data in through the audio import processor. And yeah, you'd need some sort of weird ass keyboard. To <laughs> I think the idea is to, to, module, to do some sort of digital modulation of key presses and then decode it in an external device. So you'd almost have like a. a Two keyboard data straight into the audio board. Oh, is it at a rate that? And and there's an embedded clock. Yeah. Okay, that might be feasible. It'd be sick and twisted, but it would be feasible. <laughs> huh? That's okay. Hmm. Or I am me. Oh, wireless keyboard. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> some some wireless keyboards. Hell yeah. Yes, sir. Does are you a plant? <laughs> okay, so I believe it was two days ago I committed a change that allows, it, it adds an extra menu item at the top level that says HackRF. And you go in there and it says, do you want to run the HackRF firmware? And you say yes, and half a second later it's a HackRF. So it's got an embedded image of the HackRF. It shuts down all the hardware to make sure that the handoff is, is safe, and then kickstarts the the HackRF firmware into business. So, but as of two days ago, before two days two days ago, you would have had to reflash it or run the RAM only HackRF code. Either way was not, it wasn't really onerous, but it was kind of lame. So I, it's fixed. There's a reset button. And so by default, it boots out of the SPI flash, which is where the HackRF code, or sorry, PortaPak code lives, right. with also this image of, a hacker, of the HackRF firmware. Right. Anyone else? Right. Him first. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, are you talking about the Kickstarter prototype? That should be the same same thing. Now, a jawbreaker that that won't work. So, if you got a jawbreaker from TorCon twenty twelve, then that the form factor is completely different. Uh, I would love to adapt the design to jawbreakers because people keep asking about it, but it's it it would be a big undertaking. Uh, so, yeah, the the prototype version. I mean, really, it was me just mechanical, small mechanical changes. Okay, yeah, no no changes to speak of. So yeah, you should be fine. Uh, at the risk of being the only one in the room who wants to know, uh, could you maybe, if I'm interested, take a look back at that Interstellar chip, kind of walk us through the various interesting features? <laughs> Yeah, um, as soon as I get my video back, I... <laughs> get out, get back in again. That's positive development. Oh, that's... My cursor. Okay, uh, this might be better done with the wireless wireless microphone. Hello, hello, hello. There I am. <laughs> 
Okay. So this is just a receiver. There's no transmitter here to speak of. But this is the Harris chip that I mentioned before. And it's pretty much an entire software-defined radio in a single chip. Uh, way over here, we've got a level detector that's good for just setting the gain on the analog circuitry that feeds it. There's a complex multiplier, which um, I was talking about doing frequency translation, moving a signal from anywhere in the captured spectrum down to around zero hertz, where you can start to filter it with low-pass filters. That's what goes on here, and it produces its own complex sinusoid to perform that mixing operation using a sine and cosine level that's driven by a numerical oscillator down here, uh, controlled by some sort of input from a PLL that tracks carrier and yada yada. Then we're going into a series of filters which are used to recover digital symbols. So there's a raised root cosine filter, which is kind of the ideal way to recover shaped um, shaped symbols from like Bluetooth and, and such. I'm doing this off of the cuff, so I may say things that aren't entirely true. Um, that's typically, these are typically used if you've got a shaped waveform that is designed to consume less bandwidth and be a better neighbor on the spectrum. Thank you, Mike, for that phrase. If you don't use this, if you're dealing with a strict FSK signal where it's just slamming back and forth between two frequencies, typically you would use something like an integrate and dump setup, which is what happens over here. And it just, it's effectively an accumulator that accumulates the sample values over a single symbol time and then dumps the accumulated value. And for a, like a two frequency FSK setup, you would do that for, um, two filters, the one that was at the positive deviation frequency and one that was at the negative de deviation frequency. And then you compare them, and whichever one was stronger, that indicates whether you've got a one or a zero. Um, I'm not going to talk about the PSK stuff, because I kind of ignored it, because I don't do a lot of PSKs. Um, but then we get into more demodulation, where, where, among other things, we're, we're figuring out what the amplitude of the signal is, and also what the angle of the complex sample is, so that if we wanted to do um, instantaneous carrier tracking, we could look at that value and feed it back into uh, the numeric oscillator over here to track the carrier as it changes. Um, soft decision slicer is kind of ninja for me. It, uh, my understanding of how soft decision slicers work is they, they kind of they produce outputs that represent it's kind of a one and it's or it's kind of a zero and then folds back into that knowledge of prior samples or prior symbols and makes a weighted decision based on uh, the encoding scheme and, and various other bits of information that may help it be more sure that it is in fact a one or a zero that it, that it's trying to recover from the stream. Um, this is a gain control. It's used just to, to basically maintain a, a good amplitude of signal so that the later signal processing here has enough signal to work with. Uh, in particular, I believe that this um, computation of the angle of the sample will be negatively affected if you don't keep the gain of the, uh, of the signal, the samples, high enough. Uh, I think I've run out. It turns out there's actually a whole other diagram, and that's all the, all the um, symbol tracking and carrier tracking registers and setup. So there's other magic. I didn't put it into the slides because I didn't I wasn't actually planning to talk about it. Good? And then Dominic, you had a question. Is there any capacity to do anything on the CPLD? Is there capacity to do anything on the CPLD? And that's there there are now in this stack in this stack, there are now two CPLDs. There's one on the PortaPak and there's one on the HackRF. And the HackRF CPLD has just enough logic to do what it's doing already, and that amount of logic to begin with is almost nothing. Um, effectively, it, it's just a register and a little bit of logic to invert one channel of samples, depending, and then also reverse the flow if you're transmitting, and that's about it. So there's almost nothing in there. And the PortaPak CPLD, there's a little bit more space, but 
it's it's a similar type of part where there's virtually no logic. There's certainly no multipliers. There's no none of these fancy DSP blocks that you get in real FPGAs. So the the answer, unfortunately, is no. There's no programming logic really that you could or, or CPLD FPGA programming logic you could use to do signal processing. Any more questions? Yes, sir. It it uses the uh, I, the the part is actually on the HackRF. Do you know what how many ppm you specified on that? Right, but but it uses a thirty two kilohertz crystal that is on the HackRF that is specified by. I, I would imagine it's, it, you know, in the, you know, 20, 30 parts per million. So it, it'll it'll drift. Uh, you know, ideally you'd hook it up to a GPS or something like that if it had a serial port spare to do that. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> That's a good question. So is is there um, is the is the compiler that I'm using smart enough, or is there a compiler smart enough to automatically vectorize instructions for the ARM Cortex 4M or 4F? Um, my I'm using GCC because I'm I'm trying to keep with only open source tools. Um, so in my experience, I have not been able to get it to produce good vectorized code, and I have hand coded a lot of stuff. Um, in fact, I believe I have some, if I can get, yeah, that's too small. There's basically I'm using intrinsics wrapped up in functions inside GCC to write C, C++ code, but be able to specifically insert um, instructions where necessary to get some of the clever instructions to appear in the stream. So yeah, I've, I've had to, to write stuff by hand, but in, at the end of the day, it's only been maybe a hundred instructions, and once I got them working, I just didn't touch them. So it's it's a bit onerous, but but it's a dirty job that you just get through, and and then <laughs> you don't have to deal with it. All right. Thank you. Thank you.